Hey, thank you for joining us at our online campus. As people continue to ask what it's like to preach to an empty room or to preach to a camera, I am constantly reminding myself that I'm not alone. You are there. You're sitting in your living room, on the couch, in the recliner, in the recliner. Your, your kids or your grandkids are bouncing around you on the floor. I'm not alone and neither are you. We are gathering in homes all across Lake Havasu and Parker. In fact, we have people joining us each week from all across the United States of America, even from other countries. I am not in an empty room and you are not alone. We are all here in this together. So do me a favor, let us know what city and state or what country you are joining us from. Drop a comment in our live chat and let us know where you are coming from. Let me invite you to interact with your Calvary family online even while I preach today. If you get bored, don't close the browser. But if you need another cup of coffee, for the love of all that is good, jump up and go get something to drink. Go get a refill. Last week, we, we watched lots of you guys make comments and interact with each other from Calvary. And, and trust me, from a pastor's perspective, I want you to know it is not the same as talking in church. We know we are limited in our ability co to connect with each other. So please take advantage of online chatting and jump in. It does not hurt our feelings one bit. Now, kids, if there are kids there in the room watching our worship, I want to talk to you. Now, I know sermons can be long and boring. I have four daughters. I get it. But I want to invite you to stay connected with the sermon. So go grab some crayons, some markers, some colored pencils, and draw a picture of Jesus inside the temple doing the impossible and healing the man with a withered hand. So jump up and go grab your stuff. Parents, we want to see those pictures during today's message. So snap a picture and tag Calvary in whatever social media form you use. When you upload it to your social media page, use two hashtags, hashtag Calvary AZ and hashtag impossible. Today we are continuing our sermon series, Impossible, and we're going to look at Luke chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. Now the passage will be on the screen beside you, or if you don't have a Bible, somebody from our First Impressions team will be bring, bringing one to you right now just outside your door. Just kidding. Probably didn't work that week, uh, last week uh, either. So let's read and watch Jesus do the impossible. Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 6. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with a withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them, he, after looking around at them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now, the first thing I want to point out about this passage of Scripture is that the man needed restoration. See, the man once had use of both of his hands, but now one was withered. The word Luke used to describe this man's right hand is the word seros. And the definition for that is members of the body deprived of their natural juices. It's shrunk, wasted, and withered. And the author of Hebrews used that very same word in Hebrews 11.29 to describe the land of the Red Sea that the Israelites crossed over. Uh, the ground had been wet. Now it was dry. The man once had the use of his hand, but it had been damaged. 
maimed, or mutilated. It was useless, drawn up, dried up, and shrunk. It was once a strong arm, and now it was lifeless and good for nothing. This man knew what it was like to go through life with both hands, and now he had only one. He was missing something that he once had. Is that you? Are you watching today and grieving over something you have lost? A friendship? A job? Have you lost something that was good? See, if you have, this message is for you. If you know somebody that has lost something, I want to invite you to create a watch party, either now or share this message with them later on in the week on social media and watch it with them. In this passage, you are going to see Jesus' heart for the hurting, for the broken, and for the crushed. Now, it's important to note as well that this man was not looking for life change. He wasn't asking for a miracle. Rather, he was simply there to listen to the teachings of Jesus. And when you and I continue to listen to Jesus through biblical worship songs, through biblical teaching and preaching, through reading our copies of the Bibles, even though we may not ask to have our lives changed, Jesus may just do the impossible and change our lives. So let me encourage you today. Lean in. Listen. We can learn some things about God's care for you and I through the way Luke describes what Jesus did. Now, we can see in this passage, those pesky religious leaders were watching Jesus. They were up to no good, and Jesus knew what they were up to. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 tells us that he knew their thoughts. No wonder the religious leaders had a hard time tricking Jesus. He knew their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking all the time. Gosh, could you imagine if your employer or fellow employees actually knew your thoughts? How long would you stay employed? How peaceful would your marriage be if your spouse could read your mind and know your thoughts? It would be nuts. But here's what I know. I know it sounds impossible, but God knows you completely. When I read this about Jesus knowing their thoughts, I think about Psalm 139 verses 1 through 4. Uh, one through four. The, the psalmist writes, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You know when I travel far and when I'm uh, nearby. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say before I even say it, Lord. God knows you completely. He knows your thoughts. He knows your actions. With almost 7 billion people on the planet, it seems impossible, but it is true. Just like Jesus stood up in the temple that day and he looked at each of the religious leaders, God sees you right now. He sees us. He knows our thoughts. He, he knows our thoughts when we travel and when we rest and when we are staying at home during this quarantine if you don't believe me, here are a few other verses. In Job 31, 4, Job writes, Doesn't he see everything I do and every step I take? Proverbs 5, 21 says, For the Lord sees clearly what a man does, examining every path he takes. Hagar was the name of a woman in the Old Testament who had had a conversation with God. And after she had that conversation with God and realized that God cared for her, she said in Genesis 16, 13, you are the God who sees me. It sounds impossible that God sees everything I do. It sounds impossible that God knows all of my thoughts, but it is true. And when I was a younger follower of Jesus, I used to think that that truth was scary and frightening. Like, I, I would think, God knows my thoughts. All of them? Yikes! Or, or God sees me all the time. 
all the time. But my, my perspective has now changed. I've been a follower of Jesus for 29 years and I now find the fact that God knows my thoughts and actions. I find it comforting. Think about it. God knows my thoughts and my actions. He knows my fear, my worry, my doubts, my insecurities. He knows my actions, uh, the good and the bad. He knows my motives. He knows everything about me. And if you're a follower of Jesus, meaning you, you trust that he died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sin, that he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and, and you've received Jesus as your savior by committing your life to him, then this truth that he knows you and sees you should be very comforting. See, it's comforting because God knows precisely how to counsel us when we mess up. He knows exactly what you need to hear to motivate you and to comfort you. He knows the people to put in your path to encourage you and to challenge you. He knows how to help you get back on track. And, and check it out. He knows your thoughts and actions, yet he loves us anyway. That is a big deal. If we were all capable of knowing each other's thoughts and seeing everything that everybody does, I do not think we would like each other very much. But God not only likes us, he loves us, and he loves you completely. See, in the essence of God, how God is, is made his substance, he is filled with compassion and mercy. He knows that we are not perfect. He knows we fail. He knows all about us and he chooses to love you and I with a love that is indescribable and incomprehensible. Now let's look back at our passage at the, the compassion and the mercy that Jesus showed this man. Jesus said to the man, come and stand in front of everybody. That doesn't sound very compassionate to me at first. I imagine that this man may have been a little embarrassed about being called to come to the front of the room. He, maybe he's trying to hide his arm and didn't want other people to see it. I feel the same way when I have a cold sore. When I have a cold sore on my lip, it feels like the size of a softball is sticking out from my face. And I try to hide it when I'm speaking. I, I cover my mouth. I, I hide it when I smile. Yet Jesus brought this man up from the back of the room to stand him in front of everybody before he worked the miracle. Now that man may have been insecure. He may have felt like everybody was staring at him, but the reality is those religious leaders' eyes were glued on Jesus. And then Jesus did the impossible. The man held out his hand and it was restored right in front of everybody. Jesus restored the man's hand to what it once was. It had once been strong. It had once been half the source of his livelihood. And he now had the full use of both of his arms. Jesus restored hope in that man's life. Now he could get a job, he could work to earn a living, he could hug his children if he had them with both hands. Let me ask you, that thing that you're missing in your life, that good thing that you're missing in your life, do you know that God can bring healing? Do you know that God can bring comfort? Do you know that God grieves with you for whatever it is that you've lost? And if you are willing God can restore your life too. Now, I'm not saying that God is going to bring a loved one back from the dead if that's what your loss is. I'm not saying that God is going to take away a disease that you may have, although he very well could. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you understand that you and I cling to a precious promise found in God's word in Romans 8:28. The Apostle Paul wrote, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose for them. See, I, I'm convinced that the restoring, the restoration process 
begins in the heart and in the mind. It begins with a willingness to be content regardless of your circumstances. I think this restoration process that God does, it's under the hood of our minds. It's in the depths of our hearts. That, that friendship you lost, see, if you're willing to apologize and swallow pride, God can restore it. That distant relationship with a family member, if you're willing to be humble, God can restore it. That aching loneliness you feel in your heart, and maybe it was already there before social distancing began and has now grown worse, God can bring friends if you are willing to reach out. So if you're experiencing a greater degree of loneliness right now, tell God you are lonely. Watch Him restore friends to your life. Tell God you're feeling isolated. Then reach out to a life group leader. Let them know that you're feeling lonely. Reach out to a pastor at Calvary. We believe that God can restore if we're willing to take the first step because that work of restoration and transformation begins when we're willing to move forward. God can restore your life to what it should have been from the beginning. See, if, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I want you to know God can restore your life. You were created for friendship with God. God created you and he had a very close relationship with mankind at first. But mankind, Adam and Eve, rejected God's plan. And though we thought we knew better than him. See, mankind chose to sin and God did not reject us even when we rejected him. See, God chose to restore people through the cross. Through Jesus, God's son, Jesus paid the penalty on the cross for our sin and Jesus restored our relationship with God. And God sees you right now. God knows your thoughts. God knows what you've done and he loves you anyway. God demonstrates his love for you. While we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. What more proof do you need that God loves you? Even while we were rejecting and even while you were rejecting God's plan for your life, Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. Would you like for God to restore your friendship with him today? If you do, our chat hosts are ready. So raise your hand by clicking on the hand that you see in front of you. You'll then go into a private prayer chat room with somebody from, uh, somebody from our Calvary team. Tell them that you would like to give your life to Jesus and then they're going to help you make that decision. If you are watching right now on our Facebook page, comment in the thread or send a private message to our Facebook page. A member of our Calvary team is there right now and they would love to pray with you to lead you to that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't have access to Facebook and if you're not watching online and if this is later on in the week, go to our contact page at calvarylhc.com. Go to our contact page and send us an email Tell us that God's at work in your life. Tell us that you feel like that man with the withered hand before Jesus changed him. Tell us that you feel hopeless and you feel like you're doing life alone and that you're ready to give God the opportunity to restore your life and restore your friendship with him. God has created you and he loves you unconditionally. So let us know how God is at work and moving in your heart. And somebody from our Calvary team would love to follow up with you and to pray with you. The reality is God is a God of restoration. He is a God who redeems bad situations and makes them good and even better than what they once were. And he does the same with lives as well. He loves restoring lives. He loves bringing hope back. That's what he did to the man with the withered hand. That's what he can do for followers of Jesus when we feel lost and in despair. And that is what he can do for those who are not yet followers of Jesus. He will redeem and restore your life if you invite him. 
So take that opportunity, take that time, reach out to us right now with our online chats, send us a comment or send us an email. Now I want to, to invite you all, let's, let's pray together and pray to our God of, of re re restoration and reconciliation. Would you join me in prayer? Maybe reach out, grab a hand of, of your kids if they're there, grab a hand of your spouse. Uh, if you're there in a room uh, alone, would you just lift up your hands? You're welcome to do that. We'll lift up our hands all across Lake Havasu and Parker and let's join together as the body of Christ and pray together. Let's pray. Lord, as friends and family are joining hearts together today, all across Lake Havasu, all across Parker, and even across the United States and the world, we stand as one. We thank you, God, for allowing us to have technology. We thank you, God, for allowing us to be able to connect with one another. And God, we thank you for this passage. We see your heart for us. You are the God who restores. So God, continue to do the impossible continue to change and transform lives. Lord, if there's a, an individual that is yet to trust in Christ as Savior, God, restore their life today. Show them hope today. If there are followers, followers of Jesus who are feeling hopeless or feeling lost, God, remind them of the truth that you will take every situation and work it for good. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for how you're at work. And together across the country and the world, we say in Jesus name, amen. Well, thank you for being here again today. Now, parents, don't forget, we want to see those pictures. So snap a picture, upload them to your social media page and use the hashtag CalvaryAZ and hashtag impossible. Now let's join together for worship and celebrate our great redeeming, restoring God. <laughs> 